bring in friend of the program, John Manwilling, great criminal defense attorney. John, what about this? Again, a jury might remember that quote, but will it go toward guilt? Well, look, Mike, he has disruptive behavior and bizarre behavior because his wife just died. That doesn't mean that the statements mean that he killed his wife. What they need to do, what the prosecution needs to do at this point in time is establish if he is in fact guilty, that his statements are inconsistent with the scientific evidence, specifically the way the body was found and the way the other witnesses found the body. Because the statements alone are just not enough to prove somebody beyond a reasonable doubt that they are in fact guilty. Are the, you think the prosecution's overplaying that, John? I mean, because that, they're trying to say, this guy's putting on a show. He wants his wife dead. And these over-the-top comments are just that. Well, when you prosecute somebody, it's like building a house. You want to put everything brick by brick. So that's what the prosecution is doing. They're showing you the totality of the evidence and the circumstances in which this happened, specifically that he made these bizarre statements, that he hung up the phone with 911, that he said that he found his wife face down when, in fact, the other witnesses say that uh, she was in a different position. So it's totality of everything. It's just not the statements alone. It's the big picture. Yeah. Is the prosecution scoring with this? Is it the bricks that they're laying, or are they overplaying this, that their hand with this? It could be the bricks that they're laying, but if I was a defense attorney, I would argue this guy's grief-stricken. His wife died, and who's to say how you or I would react if we saw our wives dead in the bathtub? I mean, some people would be calm. Uh, some people would be upset and angry, yelling. So the yelling and disruptive behavior or the bizarre behavior at the house and the hospital is not indicative of somebody that kills somebody. It could be somebody that's grief-stricken. It's not every day that you see your wife laying in a bathtub like that. And by the way, Mike, the fact that he was pounding on the chest, he could have been pounding because he felt that maybe he wanted to give CPR a last second or maybe he wanted to give it a last second try. Those actions alone do not determine that this doctor is guilty. Got it. Okay. And we're going to have more testimony coming up. And, and the testimony, I think, we're all waiting for is a testimony of uh, one of his daughters, Alexis Summers. She believes dad plotted this. There's her quote, John. My father orchestrated this whole plan. Tell me, though, on a legal front, what will she be able to say? Because she's not going to be able to sit in that, in that on the witness stand and say, dad killed mom. Well, whatever a witness says, there needs the probative value needs to outweigh the prejudicial effect. And what that means is whatever that she says needs to be relevant. She can't speculate. She can't assume things. So if her testimony doesn't directly go to the evidence in this case, specifically whether she saw something that was inappropriate or whether she could corroborate the motive to kill uh, the, uh, her mother, then it's not coming in. Okay, talk, talk about how you would handle her. Because if you're a defense attorney, you're going to have to go after her, aren't you? No, you don't really have to attack her. You could, you could ask her questions with kid gloves, and you mm. could establish that she is upset that her mom died. She wants her mom back. It's understandable. And she was traumatized when she saw her mom. Got it. Are, do you, are you going to flat out lay out there, though, the theory that, hey, Alexis, you're mad at your dad because he was having an affair. And just because he's having an affair doesn't mean he's a murderer, murdered mom. You could establish the fact that she is not happy that this lady gypsy has uh, moved into the house, that she was taking care of him. You could show resentment on behalf of the daughter, and that could establish why she feels that her father may have killed him. And you also could ask, you don't know that your father wanted to kill your mother. He's never told you that he despised her. He's never told you that he wanted her out of his life. Uh, out of his life. He's never had fights with her. So if you establish through her that really there was no motive to kill her, she may actually be beneficial to the hmm. defense. Okay, we're going to see how that plays out again. That testimony still to come in this case. John, uh, great work as always. The autopsy. There's one autopsy, but you have three different opinions and not one saying that it, the manner of death's homicide. That hurts the prosecution, doesn't it? Absolutely. You have uh, one theory that it's intoxication. The other one is that she uh, may have drowned, and the jury's going to think about that. And if you don't know the cause of death, then how can you possibly come back and say that the prosecution has proven this case to the highest level of certainty required under the law, which is reasonable doubt. It's possible that he may have killed her, even highly likely that he killed her, but that's not the standard. It's got to be beyond a reasonable doubt. And if that threshold hasn't been met, then the jury has no choice but to acquit him. Got it. You know, another, uh, and we talked about it briefly, but let's dig in a little bit more on the testimony of Alexis, the daughter of Michelle and Martin McNeil. You know, her... Her story is that she's caring for mom after she has this facelift. And she had weaned mom off some of these pain medications down to just two Percocet a day. Yet in her system it is this dangerous cocktail. So the prosecution said, yeah, that's McNeil himself 
given her this uh, dangerous cocktail that helped lead to her death. I mean, is her testimony going to get the jury to that place, John? It could, but then again, uh, my understanding is that her mom was afraid of pain, didn't like pain, had high anxiety, so it's very possible that after this facelift, she was the one that was taking the pills and she could have overdosed. And remember, Mike, I think something that's being overlooked is that Dr. McNeil's wife was a beauty queen. It's not uncommon for uh, ladies uh, that are young, to, uh, that g grow older, to not like the way they look. So it's very possible that she wanted the facelift just as much as he did. And I think the defense has to make that point. Yeah. And All right, again, John, there it is. This is Dr. McNeil's theories. Maybe she overdosed, maybe she slipped, hit her head on the tub. Significance of that to you? Well, remember, he's a doctor, so he's giving a plausible factual scenario based on his medical experience as far as what he thought happened. So the jury's going to take that into account. But again, I think it comes down to the science in this case. How did she die? What was the cause of death? Was it a heart attack that was exacerbated by the drugs? Did she actually fall and slump over into the water because she took too many drugs? Or was this a doctor that wanted to get rid of his wife because he had a mistress and he wanted a new life? So it's going to be the totality of all the evidence that the jury has to decide. And at this point in time, they got to weigh the credibility of all the evidence. Does the prosecution need to win that argument? And, and does the jury have to believe that McNeil was pressuring her into this facelift? I think so, because their theory is prefaced on the fact that this doctor allegedly wanted his uh, wife to get the facelift. But if they show that the wife was the one that wanted to get the facelift just as much, if not, as, if not more, then they have a problem. Remember, she was a beauty queen. She aged. She didn't look good. She wanted to look good for her husband or for herself, for that matter. That's not something inconceivable, and that's something that the jury could weigh in. And ultimately, I think Jane is right. This is a, there's a lot of gray here. Yeah. Without any cause of death, beyond a reasonable doubt, without any evidence, hard evidence in this case, the prosecution has a big hurdle to jump. Well, yeah. I hey, want to bring in criminal defense attorney John Manuelian and attorney Andal Brown, thank you so much for being with me, gentlemen, and Ryan as well. You know, you guys, they just My wrapped pleasure. up this part talking about the prescription that Steve Mickelson gave to Michelle when, in 2002 and, and that he did it as a professional courtesy. Now, this is not out of the realm of possibility. Many people do this. Um, why do you think this is significant, John? Well, I think it's good for the defense. I don't think it's bad for the defense. It establishes that uh, his wife had a low threshold for pain and that he wanted to make sure that she had enough medication not to feel the pain. And uh, the fact that she hit the headboard and there was a prior incident uh, sort of corroborates the fact that uh, he needed to make sure that she wasn't going to suffer. And in this incident, the same is, uh, it's the same. After the surgery, he wanted to also make sure that she had enough medication. And it's certainly possible that if they had an abundance of medication after the plastic surgery, that she could have pr perhaps taken too much. But, John, come on. Okay, a wedding ring, maybe he's just grieving in a certain way. He wants a black band rather than the gold band. I mean, who knows? Can we read too much into that? Ryan's not buying it, making some expressions there. John, do you buy it? No, I'm not, you know, I think they're making much to do about nothing. We don't know exactly wh what, whose wedding ring this is. Did he get married to somebody else? There's no evidence of that. I think it's a confusion of the jury, uh, for the jury, and I think the jury's going to be scratching their head wondering what, if any, significance that has. And you know what? Everybody mourns differently as this... Uh, John, this John, John, stated. let me jump in. John, the significance is that the man's wife died, that there is suspicion around this. He comes on with a different wedding ring. I mean... A lot of people okay, there well, would think you honor your wife by continuing to wear that ring or you wear nothing at all. Maybe he had two wedding rings. Maybe there was another wedding ring and he lost it and he found it and he's using this one to mourn her. There was some black uh, uh, design on it. Maybe that was his weird way of uh, mourning her. There's a lot of speculation on this, Ryan, and that's not solid evidence that yeah. this guy killed his wife. And, and John, real quick on this one. What do you make of that? Because he's in that room. They're trying to save her life and he's screaming and yelling, pounding on her chest. Ryan, I've never been in that situation, and neither of you. Everybody reacts differently, and his wife is dead. Who's to say that he was acting that way because he was animated, because he was distraught, because his wife died? He, he was a doctor. He couldn't do anything to help. He felt helpless, and he felt frustrated. It's, very, it's, it's con completely conceivable that his anger was because he couldn't do anything. His toe wasn't really helping him in any way, he's and he couldn't doctor. pull his wife out. He's a doctor, and he's making it harder for them to save her life because he is so outrageously emotional that he can't calm down to get out of the way if he can't help. And he's the guy who well, called them because he couldn't help.
Well, that's an argument that the prosecution's going to make, that he interfered. But the other point is, maybe he didn't interfere. Maybe he was so upset, he didn't know what to do. But that's not a, BA, uh, that's not a direct causation of her death. And the that fact that he blocked him... And that's yeah. what the defense... All right, John, you know, a bit traumatic, it seems, and maybe suspicious again. But as we've said, does that make him a murderer? John? I don't think there's anything sus sus suspicious. I think that he feels betrayed by his religion and his God and his venting. That's all. There's nothing more to it. But doesn't it seem it. dramatic? Doesn't it seem sort of, if you're a skeptic, that he is planting these things there, that he wants to seem like he, you know, is, is upset by this, if you're, if you're playing the state's role here? Sure, it's dramatic, but Lynn, his wife died, and he found his wife passed over on the, on the, in the bathroom. And who's to say what you and I would say or do? So it's strange, perhaps, but that doesn't uh, mean that he killed his wife. And that's what we keep going back to, suspicious. That's a good point.